Welcome, everyone. Thank you all for being here. Uh, my name is Graham Reside. I'm the director of the Cal Turner Program for Moral Leadership in the Profession. Uh, we're very grateful to be at this stage uh, of the year with you all, uh, and I'm looking forward to meeting those of you who will be new to the program. And thank you for being willing to take this uh, trip with us. Um, I just uh, want to say a few words about the program. For those of you who have been in it, you may have heard me talk along these lines before, but when we think about the professions, uh, Mr. Turner, who is here, Cal Turner Jr., is here with us today and will uh, offer a few remarks in a few minutes. Uh, he endowed this program over 25 years ago. Uh, and I, I want to reflect a little bit about what this program is and what it hopes to be and what it's stri striving to be. And I hope in some ways it uh, aligns with Mr. Turner's own vision. I would also say that uh, uh, Professor Jim Hudnut Boimler is here, and uh, it's kind of sweet for me because the two of them interviewed me for this job 17 years ago uh, when Jim was the Dean of the Divinity School. Um, and uh, uh, Dean Phyllis Shepard is also here. And thank you for being here. She is the Academic Dean at the Divinity School. Uh, so this is uh, in situated at the Divinity School, but it is a university-wide, or at least professional school-wide program. When we think about the professions, uh, if you read the literature, there's really two fundamental approaches to thinking about the, the professions. On the one hand, you have the professions as a kind of monopoly, right? Uh, only, uh, uh, only doctors allow other people to become doctors. We talked about this. It's self-regulating the profession. And this can, be a, can lead to a kind of elitism, right? Who do we let in and who do we not let in? That's a fundamental question. And I think uh, at least some of us, including my mother, think of the professions as a kind of, a kind of status, right? Oh, you're that. that. That gives you a kind of status. You're, you're, you're a doctor. You're a nurse. You're a teacher. That gives you a, you're a minister in my family. That's a big deal, right? Uh, so it gives you a kind of status. And so whenever status is on the menu, that's a kind of ethically tricky space to operate in. And thinking about who do we include and exclude, right? Historically, uh, people of color have been excluded from the profession in a variety of ways. Uh, women uh, have been excluded from some of the professions more than others, but from all the professions over time. So professions have a kind of um, tricky history. That's one way of thinking about the professions, thinking about them as monopolies, thinking about them as power plays, thinking about them as forms of social inequality, really, right? Who do we exclude and who do we include? Who's special and who's not? But another way to think about the professions is that in a complex society, right, we have to know things and put it in the service of the good. Right? So another way to think about the professions is that, is that they serve the human and the public good, that they serve the social good. Those two paths are laid out before us, right? And I think and I hope that 25 years ago, Mr. Turner invited us to think about that second path. In what ways can we be the kinds of professionals who think about ourselves not as status bearers, but as servants, right? Not as people who are special, right? But as people who are putting our education, our expertise, our knowledge to the service of the good, to educating children, right? To healing the sick. Right? to providing justice for people who have often been excluded from access to justice, to providing spiritual care, right? and to providing good jobs right, for people. Or, you know, if you're in HR, for helping people in those jobs find meaning in it, find purpose in their work. So those are the kinds of paths that are laid out, I think, before us when we think about the professions. And our job at the Cal Turner program is to try to guide us down that second path and to think about the professions in that way. In what ways can we deploy our privilege, our expertise, our budding knowledge, right, our status in the service of other people and not, not ourselves, not our group, not our clan, not our family, but this wider vision of what the good life can be. So those are the kinds of conversations that we want to host, that we want to encourage, and that we want to invite you all to be a part of and to continue to be a part of. And for those of you that have been a fellow for this past year, I'm really grateful for you all and for your participation. 
And Elaine, thank you so much for leading this program. I think it's been a powerful one. I hope you experience it that way. Um, I do want to just ask, we're, we're about to have lunch, right? Uh, and then uh, I think Lane is going to say a few words and invite Mr. Turner to say a few words as well. But before we do that, I have asked my colleague, Jada Bustiano Gonzalez, to return grace. Are there directions for how we eat? <laughs> Thank you very much. Why don't we start from this side and then we'll go this way. Thank you.
All right, for the purposes of keeping us on time and getting us out at some point on this, what is looking to be a decent afternoon, I am going to get started on the second part of our uh, introductions for the afternoon or the morning. What are we in? Oh, we are a couple of minutes still into the morning. Um, my name is Dr. Lane Walters-Young. I am the director of the Interprofessional Student Fellowship. And I just want to issue a few more thanks for uh, the existence of this fellowship and the existence of this event. I want to again thank Panache Catering for the wonderful food we are eating right now. Thank you again for your service and your food and everything a part of that. Thank you, Titan, for being here. We are a family-friendly um, fellowship and organization, and um, Titan, one of our children of our fellows, is here um, and <laughs> will be cooing along. We call him our little, littlest ethicist. But then he was um, outpaced by Jack, who is Maggie's son, who has come to some of the events but is not here today, in case you're looking for two babies. Um, and uh, thank you to Adelicia, who is doing our live streaming and recording. And they are giving their thumbs up. Thank you to Noni and Shatika, who do all of the events here at the Divinity School and are running our, also helping with the chat and the live streaming for the fellows who will be doing Q&A from a distance, we've had a number who needed to be away, and for some of our incoming class who are also watching and participating from a distance. And thank you to everyone who makes uh, the fellowship possible. We have Krista and Mehdi over there on the side who are my graduate assistants for the program. We have Matt Ferry, our photographer, who is over there on the side also. Um, uh, taking your picture today, um, and uh, we have nominators here. We have people who have joined us in conversation um, as expert conversationalists on our moral inquiry projects, which you're about to hear about, and numerous people who help us do what we do. So thank you for coming and gathering today. Uh, especially thank you to our honored guest, Mr. Cal Turner, Jr., who gave the money for the fellowship and co-founded it with the Vanderbilt leadership 25 years ago. If there is one thing you leave today remembering, it is that moral leadership is relational. It is about being a good human being who is in touch with who they are and why they are on this planet. This requires the understanding that people are different and unique and that the callings and claims on our lives made by some higher power or our own sense and sensibility are worthy of getting to know. And they are important and valuable to put to use in this world. To recognize that for yourself and then live life knowing that, that it is true for others, that they have callings and claims on their life and that they can be put to use is valuable. And I argue that if we do this, we will increase our sense of moral possibility and moral responsibility. Moral leadership is about knowing the needs of your client. And in the fellowship program, we use the word client to talk about anyone receiving services from us, the professional. But as Cal writes in his book, My Father's Business, to paraphrase a bit here, leadership is not just knowing the needs of your client or what in business language is called value but knowing how your client perceives and sees and evaluates what is that value. In addition to guiding the fellows to listen to how the client sees and sees the best way to be morally sensitive, in the fellowship year, we help students identify and connect with their motivating values and life story elements and articulate their moral compasses. We meet to critically reflect on our lived experiences and learn how to support each other across difference and disagreement, even as we dig into heavy topics such as moral injury, leadership challenges and obstacles, and personal failures. We have often asked, what is the hope for a better world? How do we sustain our hope to keep on going? And really, we find it in each other, in the people, because moral 
leadership is relational. There are people in our lives and in and through this program who are seeing moral possibility where they are, who are seeing moral responsibility where they are, and they are responding to it. Cal, you've taken the responsibility you needed to take to save the family business and ask questions that, as you write, threatened to break up your family, but which the bigger family, the business, needed you desperately to ask. Thank you for giving us the money and the mandate to follow in your footsteps, asking the big questions, seeing the possibility, and taking the responsibility. And now, without further ado, I'm not actually going to give an introduction of the biography, but there is one in your program about Mr. Turner. But I am going to say that I think his actions, his doing of giving the money and being here today, says all the introduction we need for Mr. Turner. He is a lifelong Methodist, a successful and accomplished businessman, and I do suggest that you all read his book, My Father's Business. Um, it is an interesting and captivating read for anyone who wants to learn how somebody learned to do a business and learn to follow the instincts of their lives and um, make some decisions that were not always easy. He is honest and forthright in that book about everything. That, well, not, maybe not everything, certainly not everything, but he admits some personal failures um, in there and talks about being a cocky teenager and learning from the clients and 39 cents pansies um, and um, know the humility that it takes to be a leader. We have been working on the right balance of humility and curiosity and courage um, in the fellowship. Uh, and what that balance takes. And I think uh, Cal was extremely brave and humble to give us a bunch of money with no more, more moral mandate than to investigate the dimensions of moral leadership and to seek to instill it in people. So Cal, here's your time. Thank you, Lady. Thank you so much. Thank you. Being with you is far more joy to me than you understand. It, it feels rewarding to me to have been able to establish a program that honors the real Cal Turner. That's my father, whose name this program has, Cal Turner. I have spent my career trying to understand what true leadership is. And I confess to you that I objected to the name Moral Cal Turner Program Moral Leadership. I didn't think you needed the adjective moral. Just leadership. And Joe Huff, who was the dean of the Vanderbilt Divinity School, said, now, Cal, and he, he was an irascible Baptist <laughs> and a wonderful, wonderful guy. He said, now, Cal, it has to say moral leadership to designate what we intend it to stand for. Not everyone incorporates that dimension of morality into the definition of leadership automatically, so it must be there. And I said, well, okay. And I, I'm glad it is a program in moral leadership. And I like looking at the future of, of moral leadership leadership in this room. I thank you for your interest in discovering your greatest leadership opportunity. And it is my hope that this program will aid your discovery. 
of that. So I'm I'm very pleased to be here and uh, look forward so much to hearing from you. That's why I'm here. I'm here to hear from you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Cal. All right, I am going to recognize the incoming cohort, and then we will move on to student presentations right thereafter. So the incoming cohort has um, accepted their places. Um, there is one person who, with, who did not accept their um, offer, and that is Maria Ur Urias in Divinity. Um, so, we start with in divinity, Rachel Salmon, Natalia Pearson. Natalia is here. Would you wave, Natalia? All right. In medicine, Rishabh Das. There we go. Emily Wooder is not here today. Oh, Emily is here. Okay, there's Emily. Very much here. Nina Kirkovic. I think I got the two of you mixed up. Yes. Nursing, April Riddick. Beth Connell and Michael Savick. Savas, sorry. Peabody, Carl Sadkowski. Amar Kazi and Carolyn Lancaster. From Owen, the School of Business Management, Matthew Gordon, Palak Nair, and Tanishka Parker. And from law, Jacqueline Tubbs, Dallas Castens, Yesenia Jimenez. All right. And student presentations. We are going slightly out of order. We are going to have the presentation exploring the moral implications of postpartum depression, an interdisciplinary approach. Go first. So if that group would please come up to the podium, I have your presentation ready to go.
go. Hello. Uh, thank you all for, for coming today. Our presentation is regarding the moral implications of postpartum depression, and we're here to take an interdisciplinary approach. My name is Pam Rutherford, and I am a nurse midwifery candidate. Um, I'm Siklali Padilla. I'm an MCS candidate. And I am Michael Ruth. I am a uh, MBA candidate. And then I'm Brooke Kowalski. I'm an MD candidate. Here's just an overview of what we'll be discussing. First, I'll give a brief introduction to what postpartum depression is. And then we're going to move on to an anal analysis of this problem from a multidisciplinary approach according to each of our areas of expertise. And then um, lastly, we're going to kind of wrap up with a conclusion that Pam is going to do for us. Great. Um, before we get started, I just want to make a note on language. Um, as we know, lots of people give birth and identify as women, and then there are lots of people who don't. So we, um, in the name of inclusion, use terms like birthing people. And let's get started. Yeah, so postpartum depression is a lot of what it sounds like. It's diagnosed using something called the DSM-5 which is essentially a psychiatry manual that's used to diagnose um, you know, mental illness disorders. And so technically, it's a major depressive, dis uh, major depressive episode, which is defined as five or more of these symptoms that you see right here um, that last for at least two weeks. And this episode has to begin either when the person is pregnant or within four weeks of the delivery of the baby. It's actually pretty pre prevalent. Um, it happens to about one in every seven women. And the treatment is based on kind of a tiered perspective. So if the kind of the first line for people who have very mild postpartum depression, actually psychotherapy is more efficacious than antidepressant drugs. So that's kind of our go-to number one. Um, and then if it's a little more severe, we add on the antidepressant drugs. Um, the first line is something called selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors or SSRIs. If it's even more severe and they're not responding to those two things, we can do something called transcranial magnetic stimulation, or TMS. That's essentially, um, to put it simply, a very directed kind of mini MRI that's very powerful that stimulates the parts of your brain that are underactive in people with depression, and that can actually help um, a lot of people. If that's still not working, we have something called um, electroconvulsive therapy, or ECT. This is essentially, instead of shooting magnetic waves through the brain, you're shooting electricity through the brain. This is a little more intense, so you actually have two electrodes, you push a button, and then it sends a very intense electro, uh, uh, electric wave through the brain, it actually causes a mini seizure, so you'll see the patient kind of like seize up for a, a few seconds on the table. And because of that, people have to be under anesthesia for this procedure, um, but it can be very effective. And so there are a few barriers that a lot of people don't realize to each of these treatments that have moral implications for th when we're thinking about how we can help people with this disease. Um, first of all, you have to think about the stigma of mental illnesses, especially in people who don't have any family members or friends who take um, psychiatric medications. They can have kind of a mental barrier to taking a medication themselves, not to mention for people who have lower socioeconomic status or who don't have health insurance, these drugs can be very expensive. This can be another barrier. For psychotherapy, you have to imagine people have to get off of work or have transportation to go to that therapy, and it's very important you have a counselor that you click with in order for this to be effective. Um, TMS, you have to get to and from the location, but ECT is especially difficult for patients. Because you're under anesthesia and you have those drugs in your system, you actually have somebody, you have to have somebody to drive you around for 24 hours after the procedure, which can be very prohibitive if you don't have a good support structure. Great, so that's the medical perspective on postpartum depression, and I would argue from the nursing perspective, it's essential that we consider more holistically what's going on when people experience um, mental health concerns. So I'd like to examine the American postpartum period. It's not all inclusive, but essential to consider. Uh, one being the structure with which it happens. So the nuclear family structure of two parents, um, as well as their children, with a lack of intergenerational support can really set people up for isolation. Um, as well as the cultural expectations on birthing people can be heavy. Um, so we see people dealing with issues around their body changing dramatically, the mandate for weight loss, body image, 
um, the containment in the healing process, postpartum, birth, labor, all of that, messy. It just is. And in our society, we really um, place a high value on appearing healed, clean, and, and without fluid. <laughs> um, additionally, the high pressure on feeding and how it's done, it's challenging and often it's exclusive breastfeeding, uh, can feel more like a mandate than a decision. And then the focus on the baby over the personal needs of the person who birthed. Um, in addition to this time, there's a lots of physical healing, learning to parent, and major relationship and role transitions. Um, and so as we can see, all these things are can be major stressors in addition to financial stressors. Um, and on top of that, there's the fear of getting help, of institutionalization, separation, um, and law enforcement involvement, which is particularly a concern for um, people of color and low FBS who have been targeted um, in the criminalization of parenting. So all in all this to say, our postpartum period is often characterized by individualism and isolation in the United States. Um, and we're arguing here that what we've traditionally kept as a very private time and, and mandated that, it requires us to look more closely at it and consider uh, morally what our roles are to, to serve these folks. Um, so holistically, what I'm thinking about is the concern for severe outcomes, first and foremost. So that's the loss of life, the loss of a parent, loss of relationships, employment, and the cultural and familial trauma that can come um, when there's not sufficient resources and support. Um, and what we're seeing here is that treatment is insufficient and inaccessible for many people. We know that SSRIs and alternative therapy and, and psychotherapy has its big role but that can't be the only place that people seek care. Um, and in that way, the Western white individualistic culture that we're seeing people have babies in, it just isn't serving women and birthing people well enough. And I would argue that although postpartum depression, like all mental health disorders, is in some ways unavoidable, it just happens, we don't always have a why. There's also all of these modifiable things we can do and look at in our circumstances that are contributing to this problem. Um, and it's our obligation to do something about that. All right, so <clears throat> as Pam and Brooke have already mentioned and done a great job articulating, there are a lot of reasons as to why um, individuals don't get access to the care, uh, whether or not they they can't seek it out on their own, or uh, they just don't have the means to gain it themselves. And uh, depression alone, we understand, has very significant economic implications um, to the U.S. economy. Um, postpartum depression is no exception. Uh, estimated at, at estimated fourteen point two billion dollars um, in economic costs to the U.S. healthcare system following the five years. Uh, after birth between a birthing parent and their child. Um, this, as Brooke had mentioned too, is about 7% uh, of women um, uh, that are affected by the perinatal mood and anxiety disorders, and um, that's regardless of income. Um, unfortunately, and to give a little bit more light to the disparities of inequity, uh, this disproportionately impacts lower income families uh, as much as 40 to 60 percent, it is estimated. Uh, when you look at the true cost, though, um, kind of getting away from those financial figures, we understand there's the deeper implications. This comes in the forms of reduced productivity uh, to the workforce, uh, reliance on public benefits, uh, as well as increased healthcare costs for both the, the treating maternal uh, parent and child health. Yeah, so as Michael mentioned, there's economic impacts of this. As Pam mentioned, it's a horrible thing for a person to go through in the moment. But there are also long-lasting effects of this disease. Um, before I get to those, I want to point out a few of the risk factors that um, can predispose a person to, to having this. So 
This is from a systematic review that essentially brought together 50 or more studies from the American Academy of Family Physicians. And if you forget, uh, forgot what odds ratios are, because I forget all the time, here it is. Um, <laughs> essentially, if the number is greater than one, it's an increased risk that they'll have the disease, i.e. postpartum depression, if they have the risk factor, which I'm about to talk about. So the bi biggest risk factor for this disease is a history of depression with an odds ratio of 29. So it's by far the greatest risk, risk factor. And this is why we screen mothers for it when we're doing their prenatal cancel pre uh, um, birth counseling. Now, in order to give them this counseling, they have to actually come to their pre-birth appointments, which is something that people can't do sometimes, which is an important thing to keep in mind. Um, another risk factor is field fear of childbirth. And I want to highlight this one because out of all the risk factors, it's the most modifiable. And we try and do our best that we can in the medical field of um, mitigating this. But honestly, it's a multidisciplinary responsibility. Um, people are not only fear, don't only have fear of like the physical childbirth, they probably also have fear of job implications following a childbirth. Um, family and friends can be essential in, in counseling them and, and their bosses can be essential in mitigating this fear. Tobacco use, um, that's technically modifiable, but it's very difficult. Um, the patient really has to be self-motivated to do this. So we were very careful in the way we counsel patients about this. Um, adolescence is a risk factor. And then lower socioeconomic status is a significant risk factor. Um, I kind of went down a rabbit hole digging for whether or not minority status is a risk factor. It turns out that it's not a risk factor when you control for SES and other things of contracting this but it is a risk factor for receiving treatment and following up on that treatment, which is important. And then lastly, I was curious whether or not um, military spouses were at an increased risk if their husband was deployed while they had birth. And it turns out that they are a little bit. <laughs> so this, I was surprised that it was as low as 1.1, but I, I think this showed me that um, there are lots of things that happen in people's lives. Um, we just happened to you know, have a subset um, of a population that had a very common stressor that we could study, but it's important to really know people and know what they're going through because anything could put them at risk. As far as medical implications go, um, as far as long-lasting medical implications go, children can have a failure to thrive, which just means that they don't meet their physical growth parameters. If this continues on, it can mean permanent growth stunting. They can also have what's called an attachment disorder, which essentially means they fail to develop that deep emotional connection with their caregiver this leads to kind of a slew of issues. Um, initially, they don't have that deep-seated trust that's necessary to kind of have the bravery to go out and explore the world. They don't learn things as well as they need to learn them. They have developmental delays in school. Um, they have delays in all of these domains that you see right here, which is what we really use to assess how a child is progressing. So when uh, Titan and Jack go to their doctors, this is what the doctor's looking for. Um, and then because of that, we, we often see this developmental delay manifest at one year of age. So it's important to catch this and, and get those kids the help that they need. As far as the mother goes, I was pretty shocked to learn that um, not only does this increase the risk of suicide, but suicide is a more common cause of peripartum mortality than postpartum hemorrhage or hypertensive disorders, which is pretty shocking. And then not quite as significant, but still there is postpartum weight retention. So um, as we were talking about postpartum depression, uh, I thought it would be interesting to look at how this impacts communities of color. So um, I am looking at the cultural and religious symbolism related to postpartum depression in Latinx communities. Specifically, um, I'm zeroing in on the Mexican communities. Um, and so I'm looking at um, La Malinche, which is on the left, La Virgen Guadalupe, and then on the right is um, how La Malinche extends into the myth of La Llorona. And so um, these cultural representations um, can really prevent women from expressing or reporting um, their symptoms of postpartum depression. Um, so starting with um, this dualism of La Virgen de Guadalupe and Malinche, um, there is this perception of being uh, what motherhood would look like or what pathway birth giving people should take. And so La Virgen de Guadalupe is a Catholic figure that's very prominent in the Mexican community. 
Um, she represents salvific um, and healing powers and is protective um, mother. And then La Malinche, in contrast to La Virgen, is a myth that originated in Mexico. Um, and the story behind her is that she became the translator for Hernán Cortés while um, the Aztec colonization was happening. And so a lot of people perceived La Malinche as a traitor um, and the enemy. So um, this is where the dualism between um, being good and bad and what um, being a parent looks like for people in these communities. Um, and then as we continue, um, La Malinche ends up be becoming extended into the story of La Llorona. Um, and so La Llorona, as I had mentioned, is a myth that um, many countries in Latin America hold. Um, and so the basic synopsis of this story is that La Llorona was driven to madness and ended up drowning her children and committing suicide herself. And she continues to um, haunt the bodies of water looking for her children. Um, but as you begin to um, kind of look more into the story of La Llorona, we learn that La Malinche, it actually originates from La Malinche. It's an extension of her story. And there are various um, socioeconomic factors that contributed to um, her making that decision um she didn't have the support she needed um as we think of la malinche if she was seen as a traitor or an enemy um she was isolated from her community she wasn't able to receive the care she needed postpartum um and um that impacted her um mental health um and then as I mentioned, she continues uh, to be a prominent figure in our community. It's something we look for when we are near bodies of water. Um, so it's kind of this dynamic, is this someone we should fear or is this someone we should sympathize with? And for the most part, La Llorona has been a figure we fear. So for a lot of people who are giving birth, showing those similar signs or symptoms may prevent them from actually sharing that with medical professionals or um, people surrounding them, especially if you're familiar with these myths. Um, it's also a sign of remorse, uh, the fact that La Llorona continues to be seen and heard of um, in these bodies of water. And so Jose Limon, um, I decided to uphold this quote by him where he describes La Llorona as um, a cultural symbolism of grieving, haunting mothers, reaching for their children across fluid boundaries. So as we um, take this quote and think about what kind of resources are needed for birth giving people and um, what is needed um, to help them during this mental state. Um, and so I wanted to apply this story as we uh, think about La Llorona um, to um, Latinx community members who come to the US and may not have access to the resources they need so in Mexico specifically, um, we have what is called the cuarentena. And so this is a cultural need that a lot of birth giving people may need. Um, and it's something that a lot of them look forward to and they may not get once they immigrate here. Um, so the cuarentena is around, uh, it's an experience for 40 days after giving birth. Um, and this is a special bonding time between the child and the birth giver and it's a time to um, really bond. And so the, this is a communal experience where um, their support system, like their family, their friends, their partner, um, contribute to household chores. They do the cooking, they um, do the grocery shopping, they do all of those things to ensure that the parents are able to bond with the child because the first 40 days are very um, it's a very special time during that. And then um, in addition, I put the binding of the abdomen, which is just something that sometimes um, birth givers have expressed uh, that they don't <laughs> experience here in the US context, because as Pam mentioned, it can be very westernized. Uh, we refer to this as la faja, and um, there's other proponents like having soup um, and things like that. So. Yeah, as we apply um, these myths to real life experiences and lack of cultural needs um, and maybe broadening our um, scope to include that. Thank you. Uh, 
Um, so through storytelling and the many, many years of, of attention to this topic across cultures, well as our economic impacts and impacts to the mother-child dyad, we're seeing that we have a problem here. Um, I would argue it's an issue of justice. And it brings up discomfort, even in, in myself. Um, and I'm somebody who deals with, with birth all of the time and women as my patients all the time, but to bring this into the public sphere rather than a private, isolated event that you go through in silence without support feels uncomfortable. Um, and in that way, I'd argue we all have a role to play here in addressing this issue. There's this idea that pregnancy, birth, and parenting is a private family sphere activity and then there is our professional selves. Those two things are separate, and that's, that's not how we need it to be if we are, are seeking to advance equity in our professions, um, whether that is keeping the diversity of our workplace and continuing to build it, um, as well as the general thriving of people in society, as people who have birth as women are essential members of our society it's essential to support them as such. Um, and so in that way, we're calling for an interdependence in community. And that is a very broad term. And it's really an invitation to consider what that looks like for you. Um, I often see people in the clinic not consider what postpartum period will look like, whether that's in their workplace or their families until they are postpartum. And often that's unfortunately a really challenging time to garner all of that support that they need when they need it. And so I'm asking for advocacy for the actions of birthing and parenting as essential parts of our society and to consider how we can break isolation in this culture of hyper-independence with care. Care looks different for all of us, but it's something we're all capable of doing and learning. So thank you for listening. I was going to call this Maggie's group since she sent the slides, but we'll call it the Hope Group. To the right. <clears throat> All the way to, oh, there we go. All right. Um, I just want to say to Pam's group, I now have a five-year-old, but I ended up having to be induced, and I ended up having a much more painful labor and recovery than I expected. So I know the postpartum isolation and being in it not totally prepared. And I had this wonderful community for the baby shower and come and deliver food and all of that, but it was still much more lonely and isolating and uh, dependent than I thought it was going to be. So thank you. We do need to do more work. All right, thanks for being here today. We're so thankful for all of your support and for um, your listening ears. Um, today, we are gonna talk to you about um, where we can find hope in the margins of the prison system through moral leadership in our respective professions. Um, I'm Maggie Reiser. This is Travis. Yep. <laughs> I'm Isaac. And I'm Emma. 
All right. Y'all ready? Yeah, that's what, listen, we're going to do a call and response in ours. All right? We'll come and call a response. Okay, so let's talk about this word, hope and hope in the margins, right? And so here's the first thing. How many people remember using this? paper, right? It's that archaic device that we used to use to write things on, right? But the beauty of paper that is also as a symbolism for marginalization. Because in every single piece of paper, there are these lines that are margins. C.S. Lewis says that a word loses its meaning when we begin to put our own definition on what that word means. Therefore, when we're talking about marginalization, it is sometimes difficult for us to understand exactly what we are talking about because it has been confluted with so many different meanings. And so what we have is we have on the margin, outside the margin, in the margin, and we need to define that for you so you can understand what is the existential problem which we are trying to solve. What is the problem that requires hope? You can say amen. On the margin, when we're talking about on the margin, on the margin is a barrier to re-entry. If we look at a piece of paper, there are these red lines that let us know that once you get out of sight of those lines, you are no longer in an acceptable space. The on the margin line is where re-entry is necessary and requires what we will later talk about a champion to pull you back into the margin. In the margins, on the piece of paper, in the margins are, is the biggest areas where it is the acceptable norm that we as a society says makes people worthy to be in community. But outside of the margin is the place where we put those that we have othered. There is no way to really describe the othering except it is the person that you are ashamed of of introducing other people to. The other, the relative that you want no one else to know about. The other, the child that doesn't align with your theological views. The other, the relative or the friend that doesn't have the same economic status that you have. The other, the neighborhood that you grew up in but now you have elevated yourself out of because of education. The other. And whether we want to admit it or not, we have all participated in the toxic behavior of marginalization. We have all placed people on the other side of the margins. And so when we think about this and we understand this, the so what is so important because it reminds us that it is not just one single discipline that can answer the question of how do we restore hope back to the margins. It requires the doctor of the soul, the theologian. It requires the doctors of the mind and the emotions, the counselors. It requires the doctors of the body, the medicals. The medicals. (laughs) The medicals. It requires the doctors of the law. It requires a multidisciplinary approach to solve a very toxic system. And so today, we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk to you about why it requires this approach to provide hope to those who are trying to be re-entered back into society. Because here's what the prison system does. The prison system is designed to keep people indebted for mistakes that they may or may not have made for the rest of their life. It is not designed to get them back into the margin. It is designed to keep them on the line so that eventually they work themselves back out so we can other them again, whether we want to or not. So we have the margins, and let us give you just the slightest glimpse into How big are the margins? Why is this truly such an issue in the United States? If we look at incarceration per capita, right, individuals sent to prison, the U.S. has the highest rate out of any country in the world. And as this graph shows, right, 
it's not, oh, we have a close first, second, third. No, the US essentially is around double the average of all the nations across the globe. On top of that, right, so even though the average in this country is 664 per 100,000 individuals, individual states have various rates. Tennessee is only the 11th highest in the US, yet it has a rate even higher, right, than the average of our country. On top of that, right, so if that big of an issue, what does that mean? Money-wise, right, and this is gonna be a quick um, flash through because we could, you know, we could spend an hour on this, so this is gonna be just quick facts and details. 182 billion annually between all the different facets that go into the employees, the medical coverage, everything in keeping the prison industrial complex running. How many people does that involve? Approximately two, close to two million, right, individuals actively being incarcerated on a given basis. Two million, you say, right, with our population of 330 something. But two million, which when you break it down, right, so much of what everyone's gonna talk about today, systemic issues, right? What are the systemic problems? When you look at it in context, in culture, in society, right? Essentially one in three Americans have an immediate family member who has experience with the incarceration system. Right? This is not a, oh, this just affects them. This is a pervasive cultural issue, which also means the way it infect, affects individuals is complex and thorough. Right, so to Travis's point, each of us has a role that contributes to how you try and address this systemic problem, but it's a wicked issue, right? So it, it requires knowledge of each of our work. Like we wanted to mention, moral leadership also involves following. For us to be effective, we have to understand the roles and competing interests and stake stakeholders from each of our domains because if we don't, then not only might our work be less effective, sometimes it's counterproductive, right? Because this is, again, a systemic issue. So, uh, I'm a law student and I'm gonna be a public defender. Um, if you have not been to prison uh, on a prison visit with a client, most people haven't, this is a, a pretty normal prison visitation room. What you will notice is there is glass in between the client and the attorney. Um, and to me, this tells us that society wants us to be afraid of our clients, afraid of what they've done or what they haven't done. Um, so when I've done uh, client visits, trying to make sure that I'm in the same room, saying we are on the same page, you are more than your case. You are a person with a story and a voice. So what lawyers should do is pretty simple, I think. You should be there so trying to be in the same room with your client, talking about the case, but talking about them as a person, you should come back, which seems like a low bar. <laughs> um, but making sure that you are there, you come back, what's important for me and in my practice is setting a date. You know, I will be there on Thursday at 9 a.m. And if I can't be there, I will call you and tell you that. And listening. A client knows their case better than anybody. I might know the law, but they know their life. If they were there, they probably know what happened and what didn't happen. I can't put in what I think is right or what I think should happen because I wasn't there. I have to trust them and we work as a team. I'm not the leader, we work together. Because we, at a trial, we sit together, side by side, facing this trial together, and we have to do that. So who is doing this groundwork? In our group, we were trying to figure out what is happening here in Nashville. Um, so first, the Rafah Institute is trying to institute restorative justice practices here in Nashville. The idea is that we're healing the offender and the victim. Um, don't necessarily agree with those words, but that's sort of the idea. Um, the Choosing Justice Initiative allows individuals um, facing cases to choose their representation, hence the name, to give people a lot more autonomy in their case. Um, students at uh, Vanderbilt Law School have instituted a discussion series at Riverbend Maximum Security Institution to try to uh, reduce those barriers and those walls and trying to create equality and being there. You know, we're 15 minutes away from two prisons and we have to be there. Um, and then Nashville Defenders is working on client-centered representation. There's always work to be done, um, but it's important to know who is doing that work in the community. So related to Emma's point, 
there are significant structural issues here, right? If you look at psychological distress, um, which again, I don't think typical, right, signs of feeling very stressed, anxious, um, symptoms of PTSD, th there are many factors, but in the incarceration system, there is a significant difference in rate of distress than in the general population, right? So the prison system is traumatic in and of itself, regardless of the experiences an individual has before they enter the system, odds are they will be re-traumatized, right? And have new experiences that only compounds their mental illness. To that you add, rates, and I'll, you'll see on the next slide, but what is the rates of mental illness then, right, in the prison system? It's close to 50%, right? Basically, every other person in the prison system has a mental illness history. You compare that, the one on the left, to the general population in the US, that's double. We have twice the mental illness in the prison system, but less mental health treatment, right? So. It's a known bigger issue, yet they're getting best su less support, and this has some legal implications, right? Some are afraid that what they say would be used against them. So again, right, the importance of understanding each of our roles and how that fits in the broader picture of how we can offer support. But we have, this is a, right, counseling mental health is a huge aspect of incarceration, yet there's so much more work to be done. So that could be disheartening, but thinking about locally, I want to paint you a picture of Nashville. In the past 40 years, what Nashville has done, in my mind, is a very impressive testament to mental health and community outreach. The Park Center, right, which started in 84, they're the first agency in this state to use what's called the Individual Placement and Support Model. What that means, people with known serious mental illness have wraparound services, right? They got employment support through an official organization. Before that, there's no added support, right? They would be treated just as your average individual, even though they have vastly different needs, right? So that is already a huge change in Tennessee. The mental health co-op is, they serve tens of thousands of individuals in near, uh, neighboring counties. And over the past decades, each of these services have expanded, right, and offered more kinds of services, mental health treatment, substance abuse, for different age groups, the um, pharmacy, right? That also, I think, only started about 20 years ago. So the resources have been actively expanding in our community, which leads me to the Behavioral Care Center, which is where I interned at. The BCC has existed for less than three years and it is the first alternative jail facility of its kind in the United States. Residents who attend this jail, it's still part of the jail system, right? So I, we were out of jail. But if they attended, we had mental health treatment, discharge planning, so no one got thrown out on the street, right? Unless they refused housing, they had a resource somewhere they were going. We had physical health, right? Doctors, nurses. And individuals who completed our program usually were nolly cases, which means whatever, whatever charges they had pending were wiped from their record, right? And again, this is the first site in the US to do this. So this is such a huge issue that seems so complicated, what can we do about it? But even looking at the local level, there is truly impressive work happening. So from a medical perspective, I think a major tenet of more leadership within medicine is identifying um, vulnerable patient populations and working to make their health care more accessible and equitable. So if we think about the vulnerable population of incarcerated patients, um, a pervasive disease process that affects almost half of uh, this patient population is substance use disorder. Only 5% of people who are incarcerated who have opioid use disorder receive medication-assisted treatment, which is the gold standard um, treatment course for opioid use disorder and involves um, receiving one of the three FDA-approved medications for opioid use disorder in conjunction with therapy. Moreover, 
if you have an opioid use disorder and you are released from prison or jail, you're 12 times more likely to die of overdose than um, the average member of, a popu of our population in the US. And overdose is the leading cause of death in this population. So when we think about how doctors can provide hope in the margins of the prison system, I think it's really simple. We can provide medication for incarcerated individuals who have opioid use disorder. Because if we think about it, we're incarcerating people for their disease process, not offering treatment for that disease process, and releasing them only to succumb to their disease process, which I think is a moral failing of our medical system. In terms of who is doing this groundwork, I'll first talk about Stephen Lloyd. He is a physician who practiced in rural Tennessee and had an opioid use disorder, recovered from it, and is now treating patients um, who are from vulnerable populations who have substance use disorders. If you've ever seen or heard of the show Dope Sick, the main character is actually based on, uh, on Stephen Lloyd. He is doing major advocacy work and policy reform within um, the area of bringing medication-assisted treatment into um, jail and prison facilities. The Legal Action Center is the next resource I'll point out. Um, this is a group that has put forth an advocacy toolkit for uh, both patients who have opioid use disorder and professionals advocating for patients um, with substance use disorder to allow patients to exercise their legal right to MAT um, within the prison system and outside of it. And then an alternative, um, I guess, destination for patients who are incarcerated for drug misuse is a recovery court or a drug court. Um, these are pretty prevalent across Tennessee, and yet Rutherford County was the only one I could find that had act or allowed access to MAT while patients um, served their sentence at drug court instead of in a traditional jail or prison. Um, so as you can see, there are lots of resources for patients in order to um, bring about hope in this margin of being in the prison system, having a substance use disorder, and not being able to receive treatment, but there's a lot of work to do. So let's land this plane. What is the role of the divinity student, the theologian, right? What is our role? Let's start with this quote. Before you call yourself a Christian, Buddhist, Muslim, Hindu, or any other theology, learn to be human first. Is the role of those who seek understanding to be in alignment with the creator, with God, it is to bring you back into remembering that we're all human first. That God cares about people regardless of that person has been identified as being inside the margin, on the line, or outside. We must first start from recognizing personhood. So while I'm a divinity student, I am also currently a pastor at a local congregation. And so for me, I root uh, my understanding of morality and ethics in scripture. And I think that this is an important passage for us to understand and look at as we close this. And it's coming from Genesis, the 39th chapter, verses 19 through 21. Potiphar was furious when he heard his wife's story about how Joseph had treated her. So he took Joseph and threw him into the prison where the king's prisoners were held, and there he remained. But the Lord was with Joseph in the prison and showed him his faithful love. And the Lord made Joseph a favorite with the prison warden. And you're like, what does this have to do with the margins? Well, first you have to understand a couple of things. Is that Joseph, the man who is, is, is mentioned in this, he would not have been considered someone who was in the margins at the time. His family would have been considered part of the elite class. It is the chaos in his household that then brings him down to those who were once his servants. Someone who was in the upper echelon is now a servant. And because he is a servant, he is now in a place where he is vulnerable. Let this be a lesson to all of us that none of us are so high that we can't be knocked down. And so he's at the mercy of Potiphar. 
right? He is an enslaved individual now. He's at the mercy of Potiphar, and Potiphar's wife thinks that he is good looking. And she is like, listen, I want you. And Joseph's like, nah, I have integrity. So, like, Potiphar's been good to me. I'm not going to do this. And so she frames him and gets him imprisoned. And so what we're picking up now is we're picking up on the fact that Joseph, while he's in prison, he goes through all of these trials, and he is someone who never thought that he would be in the prison of a pharaoh. What is the point of this? First, it shows us that injustice is pervasive. It impacts every one of our lives. It was someone who was innocent, who was found guilty by the accusation of someone with ill intent. And what the penal system has done is it has conditioned us to think that everyone is guilty regardless of if they say they're innocent. It shows that faith and hope reside in the dark. This is an amazing uh, revelation if we look at this because there weren't lights in the prison system of Pharaoh. The only light that they might have had was the sunlight. So at night, Joseph had nothing but God to reassure him that everything would be okay. But what I love about this is that you can connect this passage to Hebrews 11.1. 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not yet seen. And if we just go back a little bit more and look at what is the underlying meaning of faith as it relates to the Hebrew context, faith is a word of action. It is not what we think of right now because we, can, we construe faith with hope. But in the original context of the word, it meant that there was an action. So I believed so much in the divine that I would take steps towards whatever my desire was, knowing that the doors would be open. Why is that important? Because if faith is an action that can, that can be present in darkness, that means that there was a part of Joseph that could not be silenced. It means that the gifting that God had given him, he had to utilize even in the most perilous of situations. This points us back to why it's important to see everyone as human. Because circumstances do not erase gifting, talents, or skills. Circumstances do not erase gifting, talents, or skill. If you were skilled before imprisonment, you're still skilled after imprisonment. If you had the gift of speaking before imprisonment, you're still skilled after imprisonment. If you could be a teacher before imprisonment, you could still be a teacher after imprisonment. But here's the thing. In order to get people back into the margins, champions are a prerequisite for overcoming marginalization. Champions are a prerequisite for overcoming marginalization. What does that mean? It means that it wasn't Pharaoh who got Joseph out of jail. It was the borrowed credibility of the person who had Pharaoh's ear. It was someone who was willing to put their reputation on the line to Pharaoh to say, if you take a chance on this person that others have deemed unworthy, our nation will be saved. And the question that I have for you today, who in here is a champion? Who among you, as we sit in Vanderbilt Divinity and we combine all of the different schools and we talk about the moral implications of leadership, the question that we must have for ourselves is, who among us are the champions willing to put our necks on the line to end the injustice that we know is happening. Because if you're not willing to defend someone's right to be human, then you are doing nothing but continuing to keep them on the margins. And this is what moral leadership is. It's being a defender. It's being willing to have faith and hope. It's being to give people a chance. And it's being willing to be a champion to cancel the debts 
that the system is meant for them to never be able to pay. This is our presentation. Feel free to scan this QR code. We made up a list of resources that might be helpful for you, regardless of your background, to um, provide hope in the margins of the prison system. Thanks for listening. Thank you. We can also post these uh, to our website. Okay. So with Joey's group, Please come up. All right, hard to follow that one up, but we're going to try. <laughs> I'm Brandon Valentine. I'm Joy Vettianco. I'm a law student. And we're giving a shout out to Perla uh, and George, who couldn't make it today, but uh, we've got their pieces. So our topic is uh, vocation without representation, um, the moral injury of professions not looking like our communities. Yeah, yeah, that'd be great. Um, so we're gonna start with um, what recent history has taught us. And by recent history, we're just gonna go back to uh, 2015 to 2017. Um, and this is not a, a guilt trip of any sort. I just wanna make a disclaimer on that, but we're just gonna look at some information. So uh, just the journey. So there's been a lot of research done on education and how important that is and how that gets us into the spaces that uh, we are in today. Um, you know, having the privilege to be in a great institution here like Vanderbilt University uh, provides us a lot of opportunity to not only impact our lives as individuals, but the people around us as well. So give a quick example, uh, as you see here up top, uh, you know, two or four year degrees earn three times more than high school diplomas. So basic math, $100 times three, what do we get? Man, consulting. Next, uh, we have advanced degrees earned seven times more than that, than four-year degrees. So seven times 300 equals, man, I don't, I don't know how you knew that, Max. Um, but to bring that all home is like, that's $100 to $2,100. Very small scale here, but when we're doing that compounding on a life basis amongst uh, several years, whether it's centuries or it's even a decade, that impact is significant and incredible. And so we're gonna start from high school because this is kind of where it all starts as far as statistics and, and talking that journey. And so you can see here the uh, graduation rates um, from high schools from 2018 and 2019 look pretty comparable, correct? Uh, pretty good numbers as far as the percentages that are graduating, so we're excited about that. So if we go to the next slide, we're starting to get to post-secondary, so graduating college, all my 23 graduates, woo woo. All right, man, we're really excited to get out of here, all right. <laughs> and as you can see, those percentages drop, you know, pretty significantly. You know, we're looking at, you know, anywhere from 10 to 30 points. Um, it's all those bips in the business school world, but. Uh, and as you can see here, like, this is just showing some of the impact on what that is. So we're starting to get a little lower. And once again, this is a compounding factor. So the people that graduated high school might not have, have made it through college, which once again, we saw big, big gap as far as compensation goes. Uh, and then, so if you go in the next one, next slide, now we're showing the graduate degrees. Woo, woo, everybody in here, at least my cohort. Uh, 2.3 million master's degrees were earned throughout this period. And as you can see here, who wants to take a guess on what that big, Big tick is, I promise you, this is, this is no guilt here, but there we go. Man, Max, you're a consultant for real, man. <laughs> so, as we can see, big, big gap. Big, big gap. And it's not necessarily 
good or bad or anybody's fault, but it's once again just what history has told us recently is just the information. Uh, and then again, we have the doctorate degree. So even taking it a step further, we don't have information on what that that pay gap is, or but we see again the big big gap. And so we've heard the word marginalization quite a bit today. So if we go to the next slide. I'll give my take on it. <laughs> Travis and Brooke did a great job talking about it earlier, but uh, marginalization occurs when a person or a group of people are less able to do things or have access to services or opportunities. Uh, as an African-American male, I've personally uh, experienced this myself. Um, I have had the I don't know if it's the blessing or the curse of uh, being a CPA before business school, uh, but even within that realm, only 2% of all active CPAs are African American. And so that's out of 400,000. So Max, can you do that math? It's, it's, it's 8,000, so. <laughs> that's just to get an idea. So if you go to the next slide. And then let's talk about the, you know, the totality of what this looks like. So this is a study that uh, McKinsey did uh, a few years ago, and he's talking about corporate America and the jobs within that space. So uh, in my experience, it's not that people have not had an opportunity to have a job, uh, whether you're a minority um, of color, whether you're a woman, um, sexual orientation, whatever that may be, but as we go through the progression of a career and what that looks like, you see that funnel gets bigger for some groups, but gets drastically smaller for other groups. And so what does that mean? It mean, essentially means the people that are in the room making decisions upon their employees, upon their company members, uh, are not having any representation in that room. And what, what, what impact does that have? So one, psychological safety. We talk about that a lot within the business school. Uh, and I think that's kind of a common trait with amongst uh, all graduate students, but um, you know, not being able to be your true self in the spaces that you need to show up to. So whether that's work, whether that's your neighborhood, uh, whether that's community service, whatever they may be, you know, what does that look like and what does that impact have on you? How can you be your true self? How can you show up and how can you really make an impact? Next is empowerment. It, it, makes, a, it makes a bigger difference, at least for me personally, you know, being in spaces where I had somebody to relate to, whether it's, you know, me being a former student athlete uh, in undergrad or seeing somebody that, you know, has the same background as me as far as, like, story goes, as family members. We have a personal connection with humans when we can relate to them quite a bit. And what does that do for us in the long term? It makes us want to work harder. It makes us want to stay a little later to do that assignment or go the extra mile for one another. And we're, I'm summing all this up because this is what we're here for as well. You know, this is a very beautiful room right here. And we are doing a lot of those same things as far as relating to people. Uh, we have the passion for moral leadership. We have a passion for leadership. We have a passion for education. And we're here all trying to figure out how can we make an impact and make a difference uh, in the spaces that we're going to post school um, or even in school. And then finally, um, students and employees model themselves as the people that look like we, like we just talked about. Uh, so just once again, just to give you an idea of what this looks like in the corporate field. Uh, and then next slide, please. And then as the business student, I'll talk about the numbers and money, because that's what we like to do, right? And consulting. Um, next slide, please. All right, so these are just a couple headlines that I grabbed from uh, the Wall Street Journal and Bloomberg. Um, and once again, this is my journey, not necessarily everyone's journey, but my perspective on this take. Um, so as a business school student here at Vanderbilt Owen, I am the only black domestic non-military male in my class at 180. <clears throat> I did not know this until one of my African colleagues pointed out to me last year. And I was like, oh, man, like, there's like eight of y'all and there's only <laughs> one of me. It's uh, very interesting. But that got me thinking and trying to understand what can I do? I mean, I, I, I wake up every day trying to make sure I'm putting my best foot forward, but what can I do to make an impact on this community here at Vanderbilt to open the eyes of others? Say, hey, you know, we need more Brandons out here. Or even on my classmates to say, you know, I'm, I'm not just a, an Owen Business School student, but I'm also a black man in a privileged space. Uh, and I also organize my privilege as well because uh, some, of my, some of my friends back home don't really understand what I'm going through up here. And 
being on campus 12, 13 hours a day and hanging out with, with Mario and Kathleen and the, and the Turner Family Center and all hours of the day. All right, so next slide, please. All right, so let's go with some of what these trends look like as far as on a, on a negative space. So uh, representation, or lack thereof, as I have stated up here. Um, once again, we gravitate and we will learn more from people that we can relate to and work with on a regular basis. Uh, another barrier is dollar dollar bills, as I have there. So grad school is very expensive. So top MBA programs uh, it will run you about a quarter million dollars to get through. So I don't know who has that on hand, but I did not. Uh, but with that being said, very thankful for the champions, as Travis pointed out, uh, that are willing to invest and donate into students to have this opportunity to come to uh, institutions like this um, and get some economic uh, financial help to be successful in these spaces. So not a lack of skills or will <laughs> uh, to do the job, but mainly, mainly the means to get here. So when I get here, you know, we want to make sure we were putting our fit, uh, best foot forward. And then mentorship. Uh, the business school world, uh, less than 10% of, I think on average, of all students within the business school, top business schools, um, are of African American descent. And we can keep going with, with the other uh, buckets as well. But it's just to highlight, it's not, once again, it's not to say this is good, bad, or indifferent, but just to point out these are, these are facts and these are uh, things that we need to discuss and maybe potentially address. Um, so whether that's providing more opportunities for people within the corporate space to have seats at the board table, uh, to bring other opinions to the, uh, to the board table, to the meetings. Um, I had the opportunity of working in Chicago this summer at a healthcare real estate investment firm that was led by, uh, what, that was led by a woman, which was very, very uh, exciting for me as a Fortune 500 company, and I'm being in board meetings, getting information ready for them, and at the top of the table is, is a woman, which I haven't seen much in my life, and you know, she commanded the room like nobody other that I've seen other than my mother, maybe. Um, but it was very exciting. Uh, and then we have a quote from uh, a former, the former Harvard Business School dean, um, just essentially highlighting the fact that you know everybody can do better. So if we go to the next slide, all right. So what can we do? Um, so McKinsey had a, you know, more consulting. Uh, can, can, uh, McKinsey had a, pro, like a procedure like reflection, review, realignment, response, and reform. Um, and the things that pointed out, like jumped out to me, were one access to capital. So one that capital can be human capital financial capital, time, whatever that may be. Like capital is not, capital, capital is not just money. Um, and we want to keep that in mind. And I feel like at the business school, we've done a good job this year of taking a good step forward with that. Um, one by launching an impact investing class uh, that Mario has been a part of and um, the former Dean Johnson, uh, which we've done a great job of really getting out in the community and actually talking about that. So uh, one, talking about monetary capital. So partnering with not-for-profits within the, the community, corner to corner being the main one, partnering with, partnering us with young entrepreneurs or entrepreneurs of color in the area, and also partnering them with the students, the business school students that we have on campus as well. How can we bridge that gap and do education on, yeah, how, we can, how can we bridge that gap and do education uh, on getting the two communities to align, uh, to discuss, to talk about their experiences and how we can team up to, to build more equity, to build more capital uh, for the communities. And then pro providing exposure and opportunities. So once again, big piggybacking on that impact investing class, but also needing organizations like uh, Management Leaders of Tomorrow uh, and the Consortium. Um, the Consortium is a organization that helps uh, minorities, people of color, and women get into uh, these top business schools throughout the nation uh, with quite not only financial uh, capital, but also with the human capital that we were talking about. So having mentors that may not be available to them on a regular basis that I didn't have access to growing up, uh, but giving them the confidence like, hey, I've done this before. This is the stuff I went through. This is stuff you need to be prepared for to be successful in your space. And it's be not because they couldn't do it, but uh, we all need a little help out here. And then finally, strategic and initial hires. Uh, intentional hires, um, same thing. So 
Uh, I will go to the next slide. And I think we get into the medical profession piece intake of this. Maybe. Maybe. George. I'll, I'll freestyle. <laughs> so we, we did have some meetings about this. I can't speak um, from a professional medical perspective, uh, but the first group did discuss uh, how there is a gap in care within people of color within the medical space. Uh, Consulting. Um, <laughs> uh, we'll just walk, we'll follow George's slides and we'll just go off that. Uh, yeah, I think Brooke talked about this and um, she did a great job. And yeah, ophthalmology is the study of, what is it, the eyes? Consulting. <laughs> uh, but once again, statistics to show that there is a change. Man, oh, all right, well, yeah. all right, next slide. All right, Joey, take it away, baby. All right, so my name is Joey Vettianco. I'm currently a 2L um, second year law student at Vanderbilt, and I'm gonna talk about the legal profession. So um, the legal profession, of course, just looking at all these statistics, it's not as representative as it stands. Um, I'm not going to go through each demographic, but basically um, the 2020 census data shows, taken by the American Bar Association, shows that our profession is still 86% white, but um, is only 57.8% of the entire population in the U.S. Um, and so entering law school as a person of color, I think that's students of color, students from other marginalized identities, I think one of the first things you notice is just, is kind of that feeling of being an outsider and that imposter syndrome. Um, and not only that, but there's also a lot of students um, who are the first in their family to go to law school in an environment where there's a lot of law students or the, the second, the third, or even the fourth in their family to be law students. Um, and there's certainly an, an advantage that comes with that. Um, the law school survey of student engagement showed that only 29% of all students are the first in their family to go to law school. So students are still entering an environment where um, even taking aside just different demographic data that we typically look at, there's this informational advantage that a lot of students have. Um, first gen students certainly come to school with less information than their peers. Um, and there's this thing called the achievement gap, which refers to the disparity in academic performance that measures grades, test scores, dropout rates, and even course selection between groups of students who come from lower families and those who don't. So the problem seen is that many students who are under, underrepresented are the first gen or had overcome challenges um, to, that actually allow them to be these really great leaders and have the greatest capacity for leadership. Um, they often don't take on those roles because of these barriers that exist. Um, so the solution is how can we overcome that? Because as lawyers, law degrees matter a great deal. Uh, there's the obvious of members of Congress where um, those who represent us in Congress and even the current president have law degrees. And if the people who are entering law don't share or have the same experiences as most of the country, then how can we expect the profession to promulgate representative laws or ensure adequate representation within the judicial process that's supposed to be fair and equitable? <coughs> so the moral injury, <coughs> excuse me, can occur both on the part of the client and of the lawyer representing the, the client. And so when an individual is in a position to have someone else's life or safety in their hands um, in this required due to circumstances, they have to be a witness to an act or directly act in a way that goes against their moral beliefs. That's when a moral injury occurs. So as lawyers, um, as the law students in the room know, we have to take a course called professional responsibility. Um, we have to take a professional responsibility examination as part of our licensure. But if anything, um, those are pretty lax standards. And and from what we read in the class and in terms of just 
these circumstances or where lawyers are disciplined, um, often it's just a slap on the wrist and there's no meaningful um, consequences. And, and most importantly, it's the clients that take the brunt of those consequences and not the lawyer themselves. Um, so if we want to look at moral injury, we don't need to look any further than some of the um, cases that have happened in the professional world. I'm sure s many of you in this room are familiar with the Enron scandal, um, where there was the shredding of documents and massive accounting scandals on the part of the uh, Arthur Anderson accounting firm. Um, and then, of course, as other groups have mentioned, the mass incarceration, a system that incarcerates, but then um, the lawyers and the judges who are sentencing those incarcerated often don't look like or have the same experiences of the communities of those being incarcerated. Um, and the legal profession is unique in that it has the chance to get justice for individuals within the institution of the justice system, but it also perpetuates a lot of injustice in those who are unjustly incarcerated for too long of sentences or left financially harmed without a remedy. And, and to take a step back of the, mar the mass incarceration system, um, we also have to look at who developed that system, and that's the legislators who've taken, um, who often come from a different subsect of society and have taken a lot of that, I think, kind of restorative justice element of a case-by-case situation and um, instituted a, a system of mandatory minimums where basically um, the facts of the case, um, how the individual has kind of repented and restored um, the harm that's been done is not part of that equation that's that's done. If anything, it's it's literally just a chart where you look at the offense, you look at like if there's any prior offenses, and then there's just a chart of how many years they get. So it takes a lot of that latitude that can really promote um, just outcomes out of the hands of lawyers. And then looking beyond the um, the criminal justice system into the civil justice system, particularly with law firms, um, law firms who like Enron. Um, who, who represent clients like Enron or Arthur Anderson even. Um, they represent the biggest organizations within our modern economic system. And so this is a headline that I pulled from the New York Times. Um, so partners are basically those who have like a direct share in the profits of a law firm. It's a very um, hard and prestigious kind of role to assume. But um, if you look at the demographics among law firms, um, there's very few uh, the major law firms that even have partners that are people of color or come from other marginalized identities, um, mostly men as well. So um, it, it begs that question of how does that drive in the direction of the organization um, when the people advising their legal strategy don't represent so many of their clients? And in how many ways is that lack of perspective and lack of diversity inclusion efforts, how many times is that actually promulgated in these situations like Enron? So on that uh, very bright note, I wanted to at least talk about a solution to this. Um, and we don't even need to look beyond Vanderbilt to find a solution. Um, there's one that helps solve, that is help, currently helping solving the part of representation within the legal profession. And I can speak to it because I was a part of it. So One Elevate is a leadership cohort um, within the law school. I was the first, um, I was one of the 10 of the first ever class that started with my year. And um, all of us, or, or 10 students, selected out of the entire incoming class of the law school. Um, and we're all the first in our family to go to law school. And this program is so special in that it explicitly empowers us to have skills and information to be leaders in the school, in the community, and in the profession. Um, and it's not only skills to become a leader within the law school community, it's how can you become a leader after you leave law school for those who want to run for office or become a partner in a law firm or um, on the public interest side if they want to work in the justice system. And because it's historically not people from marginalized communities, who, w even with a JD, that are these leaders. Um, and change isn't going to happen without people having diverse lived experiences. So this program, what I, I think it does is not only is it, um, you get paired with both a 3L mentor, um, and then those of us who served in it this past year, we were mentors um, to the, the 1Ls this year. And then you also get a community mentor. So that's an actual attorney who has had a lived experience similar to, to what you've gone through, um, who can also guide you and just give you um, a lot of information that, you know, when you have peers who have come from lawyer families, like when to apply for summer jobs or how to take a law school exam. Because I remember that 1L fall of being told I have like a six hour contract exam. I mean, that's a really daunting experience. And I mean, even when you tell people who are not lawyers, yeah, I got to take an exam on, a f on Tuesday, that's five hours. It's a really daunting thing. And if you don't have that in informational no, then you're at a huge disadvantage as it is. 
So in terms of these programs, um, I think One Elevate, solutions like that that are being implemented not only here, um, that have made a difference in my own personal experience um, that allowed me this year as a 2L um, to become president of a student organization and being involved with this fellowship. Um, it, they just really empower students and it's, it's one way that we can start in the law school of how to empower students who are first gen, come from marginalized um, backgrounds and can set them up to be leaders within the legal community. But I, th but I also wanna highlight too that um, recruitment doesn't just start when we're in law school. We gotta change who applies at law school. We have to change how we, when we talk to people about law school, we have to start as early as we can um, in order to get the payoffs of having a more representative profession. And so where do we go from here? So as, as many of, um, as, as Brandon and some of our uh, other colleagues have said, um, money of course is a big part of it, is just funding um, these programs because One Elevate is a fantastic program, program and it's produced dividends, but I know one thing is, is like the long-term funding. There's always kind of that solution in being able to, there's a limit too to how many students you can have because of funding measures like that. But I think equally important too is, and a lot of people sometimes overlook, is you also have to have the time investment. So you have to have people who are like administrators who work within the school who will set aside time to set up these meetings, um, to, to recruit students, and to be able to kind of have this infrastructure to, to help empower students. But you also have to have lawyers who've um, faced these challenges, overcome them, and become leaders in their own communities, willing to give back their time and become mentors um, to the next generation of legal professionals. I think that is everything I had, and then we will move over to, to um, higher education. Hopefully this video will work. Hello everyone, uh, I just wanted to say I wish I was there with all of you today. I'm currently in North Carolina celebrating with my family. Uh, we have baptisms going on, we have birthdays. So I didn't wanna miss out on that, but I hope that everyone's doing well. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to quickly hop in uh, via this Zoom session and talk about higher education professionals and talking about how we may not always see representation in higher education spaces, spaces specifically uh, within faculty and staff slash leadership. So to get started, um, I wanted to talk about the faculty dilemma. I was reading um, something for class and it's called Race Without Racism, how higher education researchers minimize racist institutional norms. And in this study, it talks about how, um, well, there's this quote that says, without adequate socialization, faculty of color are prevented from participating fully in the academic workplace. Highly structured mentoring programs and minority postdoctoral scholarships may serve as possible tools to socialize faculty of color. Accordingly, instead of addressing institutionalized socialization norms that sustain white supremacy, the proposed adaptation onus just plays on minoritized faculty. And similarly, I have another uh, quote from the side talking about how um, in order for the faculty to represent what the general population looks like in the United States, um, it would need to be happening, and it would need to be diversified at about 3.5 times the current pace if we want to see representation by 2050. Um, and oftentimes they talk about this pipeline problem about how if we make the professoriate more attractive then maybe more people will want to join. But I think a lot of institutions of higher education still have a lot of reckoning to do with the fact that they sustain white supremacy and that they are in existence because of white supremacy since these institutions were originally not built for non-white students. And then I just have these two graphs at the bottom that kind of show you the breakdown of what professors typically look like. Um, so as you'll see um, on the left one, clearly more than 70, if not 80% of professors are white. And then if we compare the faculty ratios to like what students are kind of looking like undergraduate wise, we see that um, Students, students are underrepresented by faculty if they are non-white students. And then we go into the staff and leadership dilemma as well. Um, so as you'll see on the left, 17% of college presidents are racial minorities. 
only 36 of minority, 36% of those minority presidents lead associate colleges and only a mere 5% of college presidents are women of color. So that's a vastly low number. Um, and the chart on the right also kind of looks at it, the breakdown of what staff looks like in terms of different positions. And you'll see that each of the color means a different race um, and how prevalent they are in those spaces. So as you'll see, um, the most representation is actually in service and maintenance. So you can think of uh, your janitorial staff, the people working in dining halls. Uh, so those are the people who are kind of a little bit more representative of what the student population is starting to look like, um, but also just like what the population outside of academia, outside of this ivory tower looks like. And so I wanted to dive into why this is important. Um, both faculty and staff diversity are instrumental. Uh, they are necessary in order to uh, see more representation. Um, so I'll read both of these quotes. Um, faculty diversity plays a key role in college student completion, can have a major impact on student sense of belonging, retention rates, and persistence. All students benefit from faculty diversity. Engaging with diverse faculty and different perspectives builds empathy and respect for others and creativity and improves problem solving skills. And Black and Latino students who are pursuing college degrees in greater numbers are more likely to graduate when they have diverse faculty members who look like them and can serve as positive mentors and role models. Discussions of diversity in higher education often focus narrowly on student populations, but demographic diversity among faculty and staff is also critical to the success of colleges and universities. Research shows that diverse companies and teams are more innovative and productive, and experimental evidence suggests that white staff making and decisions affecting persons of color engage in more careful, considered, and conscientious decision-making when working in diverse groups. Demographic diversity among faculty and staff is not only a byproduct of equitable hiring practices and a key source of diversity of perspective in the academic profession, it is also essential to engaging, educating, and inspiring increasingly diverse populations of undergraduate and graduate students. Lastly, I want to end with saying that, you know, Harvard University is one of the like universities at the forefront of this nation, um, even outside of the United States, it's such an influential college university. Um, so it's really important that uh, this was, this is the new uh, president of Harvard, Dr. Claudine Gay, she's a black woman. And it's really, really important uh, that she is now in this role because it'll be a huge win for self or for representation for students who identify with a lot of the same identities that she personally identifies with. So yeah, uh, that wraps up my part of it. Um, really hoping that as the student population diversifies, so does the uh, professoriate and staff. Um, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to email me directly. Otherwise, uh, it was great being part of this fellowship and good luck to everyone else who's presenting. Thank you. And that's our presentation. So thank you all so much. All right, we have one last student presentation. Thank you all for those of you who are hanging with us on this long afternoon. This always goes this way, but thank you uh, that we just have lots to say. Um, our last group is our most interactive group, so there might be jumping jacks. There's a former teacher. There are handouts. There are pens. There might be other interactive things. I am going to hand over my computer. Computer system to, yep, Max, because he has those interactive qualities I was telling you about. And they are doing their presentation on authentic leadership, because they decided not to go with that whole semicolon academic stuff. But if you have to go, thank you for being here.
we do realize the time. Thank you for coming and thank you for staying. We're grateful to all of you. Oh. Okay, Max, you still have to speak into the microphone for those zooming yeah. online. All right, if everyone could please take out their phone or a laptop or tablet and go to joinpd.com and type in this little code, S-O-I-U-Z-G. We're gonna use this to have some uh, kind of question and answer and some more interaction with the audience. One connected, yay. I was a teacher during COVID, so this came in handy. <laughs> Okay, as we're getting our critical mass of participants, um, we've been sitting for a long time, so also as a body-based counselor, I would love for us all to kind of innervate our bodies. So I'll invite you to stand up if you'd like to and are able, and let's just kind of reach toward the sky. One more time, woo! And let it go. Okay, grab a seat again, thank you. And I'll just invite you to take some soothing breaths in through your nose and out through your mouth. And continue breathing, trusting your own body's natural rhythms and start to kind of check in with how your body's doing. We have some mashed potatoes in our bellies, some peach cobbler, we are nourished. And maybe check in with um, some idea or feeling or image that you're grateful for from the wonderful presentations we've heard so far. So kind of breathe that into your body and think about it. some gratitude that we are the last presentation. And it's a beautiful day, and we will all soon be outside. OK, so let's get started. All right, so um, my name is Max Duncan. Oh, wait, this is not an updated version. Oh, well, I use him, he, him, and they, them pronouns. Um, Stephanie is also uh, in our group due to unforeseen and unavoidable circumstances. Can't be here today. And uh, I'm Grace. I'm a PO at the law school. Very honored and grateful to be doing this with Max and Stephanie. All right. Um, so we are covering this topic of authentic leadership. So we're kind of zooming out from the other presentations. We're going to provide some context to how we arrived at this topic. Uh, provide some definitions, what, is it, what does authenticity actually mean in the workplace setting, talk about characteristics and the impact, and also leave you with some useful recommendations. So first, to provide context, uh, we kind of began with this inquiry question of in what ways are creativity, emotion, and identity truncated within the workplace? What impact does that truncation have on the people in that workplace? And we took as a premise that workplaces, which have systemically advanced the capital of white cis American men, assert their way of being as an assumption and then presume that way as neutral. So we step into a workplace and the kind of white male way of being is the neutral expectation from which non-normative identities must then alter, conceal, or swallow themselves in order to survive within that traditional workplace. 
So our furthering questions are what is lost when we assume and assert only one way of being within the workplace? In what ways might creativity, emotion, and identity enhance, deepen, or expand the workplace? And finally, how does it depend on the setting with where you are? We realize that these ideas of creativity, emotion, and identity can all be kind of uh, subsumed within this topic of authenticity, and so that's how we arrive um, at this topic. Why it matters to us prof uh, personally and professionally and why this is interesting, um, I'm about to transition into a new internship space where the fir for the first time I am centering my trans identity in the work I'm doing and being fully out in the workplace. And I'm doing that because I want to serve the queer community here in Nashville and want to serve uh, uh, kind of a wider array of individuals. And so um, I'm nervous and afraid to do that, but it feels really essential to the people I'm serving and the work that I'm doing. And then for me, um, I've kind of been in a lot of professional spaces or academic spaces where people talk about really valuing things like racial justice or economic justice. But then, for instance, when all of the anti-Asian hate during COVID was happening and is still happening, I was told to save my concerns for AAPI Heritage Month, which was three months away. And I feel like as a law student and as an Asian American female, it's really important for me to show up as myself and to show up with the issues that I care about and that affect my community without someone telling me that it's reserved for three months later. Okay, and to further contextualize, how did we get all of this information? We spoke with Ashley and Ranga. Ashley is the director of the Vanderbilt Students Center for Social Justice and Identity. And Ranga is uh, one of uh, uh, Stephanie's professors in the Owen School of Business. So we spoke with them both separately for about an hour to two hours. Um, we also used the white supremacy culture document from Dismantling Racism, or workbook for social change groups, which was really essential for conceptualizing uh, the so sort of normative uh, uh, tools of white supremacy culture and some antidotes to liberate us from those expectations. Uh, some limitations, we did not c conduct exhaustive research uh, of all the kind of peer-reviewed uh, literature from across different professions, and here we're only representing law, business, and counseling slash education. So we're gonna start by just defining what does authenticity even mean? And we're gonna start with a question. So on your phone, you should be able to type in an answer to this question. So call to mind an authentic mentor, colleague, or leader. In a few words, what are their qualities? So I'm seeing honesty, humility, genuine, good listener, brave, integrity, flexibility, humility is coming up a few times, non-judgmental, a change agent, vulnerable. Yeah. Open and honest. Uh, so as we're getting some more responses, uh, would anyone like to share a bit more about this person that they have in their mind? Um, I thought about um, our, one of our professional responsibility professors in the law school, um, and she is somebody who you can tell what her, her convictions are in class, but at the same time, she's very open to hearing others' opinions and changing her mind and admitting when she is wrong. And I thought that was an admirable uh, quality in a lawyer as well as in a professor. Thank you. So they have strong convictions, but they're also flexible to the needs of the room. Would anyone else like to offer an anecdote? 
or a person they have in mind. Yes, I'm very comfortable with uncomfortable silence. And you will join me in it. Yes, Graham. Listens very carefully and does what you just did, which is sits quietly uh, while I'm uncomfortable until I can get my head together. and. And then listens, uh, I find, very generously. So I'm very grateful for her generosity and this kind of calmness, this deep calmness, which you, I bring a lot of anxiety. We can talk about that later, Max. But um, yeah, the calmness that that, that leader brings and, and then that generosity. Calmness and generosity. Yeah, so I can trust this person to be emotionally regulated uh, when I need to rely on them. And um, they're going to listen very clearly to what I'm saying and value that input. Thank you so much. Don't worry, this is not the end of the awkward silences. There will be more. <laughs> OK, so to be clear about what authenticity is not, this was actually really clarifying in our discussion with Ranga. So authentic authenticity is not just following your impulses in an unfiltered way. It's not just doing whatever you want with disregard to others' well-being and your role responsibilities. So just because you're hungry doesn't mean you can abandon the meeting that you're supposed to be running. Um, it's also not a noun, uh, meaning uh, it's not a fixed state of being or an immutable quality, it's something that we're always pursuing, something that's in progress. We are authenticity aligned or inclined. We are not necessarily authentic. And it's not prescriptive. It, by, by its very nature, it is subjective, it's individualistic, and it's determined by each person. Um, what it is, can you go back one more? Um, so there are three different ways that authenticity might show up. There's internal authenticity, which is what I expect of myself. Um, am I in alignment with my values? There's my external or my role authenticity. What is expected of me in my role? Um, am I in alignment with the values of my role and my setting that I'm in? And aspirationally, am I in alignment with my long-term goals or with the goals of the collective? And you might be able to see that those internal and external versions of authenticity are, may often be in friction with each other. So there's a, a, sort of a give and take of what do I need, what do I want to do, and what is required of me in my role. And that is requiring constant emotional labor. Um, so what Graham described of uh, having emotional regulation, being really calm, uh, they may be really activated and really frustrated, but in that moment, what's required of them in that role uh, can't allow those kind of internal experiences to come out. So um, it takes a lot of emotional work to do so. Uh, then we're going to talk about some characteristics of authentic leaders. Um, did we want to do the pair deck? Or are we good? No, we did that earlier. All right. So y'all typed in lots of things earlier. Um, but here are some characteristics that um, we have found in a lot of the leadership literature. Yes, this exists. Um, authentic leadership has actually been around for a really long time since the 1960s, um, but it wasn't until 2003 when a man named Bill George um, wrote a book called Authentic Leadership, where it really started to show up in different spaces in business schools and law schools and things like that. Um, so here are four characteristics. Um, the first is self-awareness, um, sort of knowing your strengths, your weaknesses, um, your limitations, and thinking about ways that you can change and grow. Um, another is just having good listener skills. Um, a lot of the times people think leaders are those in the front of the room, but it's actually the people sitting right next to you, and you have so much to learn from those around you. Um, additionally, um, we all have emotions, and it's okay to cry, and it's okay to show them in the workspace. Well, Max and I think so. Some people might not. Um, but part of this is being able to deliver and receive honest feedback. And sometimes receiving feedback is hard, but making sure that you take time to reflect before you maybe respond in a not so pleasant way. Um, and also, authentic leaders are driven by relationships. They understand that the things that they are doing are meant to benefit the organization and the team and not just themselves. 
you thought I was done, here are more adjectives. <laughs> um, so first is accountability. Um, Tony kind of mentioned this with her example, but making sure you're okay admitting mistakes when they happen. Um, empathy, I feel like that's a given. Just be kind to one another. Um, humility, this is a word that we talk a lot about in the fellowship, and it's something that we are trying to figure out what exactly that looks like. And we also want to make sure we're thinking about our long-term goals and how they relate to our ethics. So kind of underlying all of these adjectives is making sure that you have an internal code of ethics, things that you really value, and things that aren't necessarily going to budge just because people are resisting against them or because there's a lot of external pressure. Okay, so here we are pulling from uh, the Jones and Okun white supremacy culture document. So along the top, uh, you'll see affects of white supremacy culture, how um, uh, it may innervate a uh, institution, and then along the bottom are the antidotes to that culture. So I'm not gonna go through every single one. Uh, one that's been really important and prevalent for me is the last one. Um, White supremacy culture encourages us to focus on the product over the process. The outcome is more important than how something is done or how people were treated along the way. So um, flipping that on the other side and valuing the process over the product, we're focusing on the way something is done uh, and saying that that's more important than what the outcome is. Are we valuing people? Are we treating them well? Are we taking time to check in when, with one another and preserve relationships? Um, Another one that's really prevalent, I think, at a high-achieving institution like Vanderbilt, especially among the student body, is this feeling of perfectionism, which is that um, my output, my product, is defines who I am. And we can uh, provide an antidote to that by developing a culture of appreciation, by uh, singing people's praises, um, and separating the person from the mistakes. So when we're offering feedback, we're focusing on the idea, not the person. Here are also more words. Um, I think the things that really stand out to me are um, sort of the affect of paternalism because I feel like in so many spaces there is a hierarchy or you feel like there's a hierarchy. So for instance, between the lawyer and the client, the lawyer is the person supposedly with the most legal knowledge, but that does not mean that legal knowledge is the only thing that matters. Um, Another one is fear of open conflict. I am personally very guilty of this. I hate arguing. I don't like conflict. I don't know why I'm becoming a lawyer. But <laughs> we need to recognize that just because we're being polite with one another and we're promoting peace doesn't mean that that's the best thing for your organization, for your group, or for your work. And you should be willing and open to speak about things that are uncomfortable, but also make sure that after that happens, you check in with one another. And lastly, um, I think American society overall is pretty individualistic, and that's sort of come up in other presentations as well, but we should really be elevating one another and developing one another's skills instead of just focusing on ourselves. All right, one more opportunity for interaction and awkward silence. Um, so I'd like you to now think about your own person. Call to mind a safe, authentic, it could be a workspace. Many of us have not experienced that in a workplace, so it could just be a space you've been in. And in a few words, how did that space make you feel? Seen, encouraged, empowered, valued, supported, loved, freedom, safety, nurturing, welcomed, inspired. More than a body in the way. Able to take on challenges, so feeling resilient. Like I could be myself, my professional self, 
and not have to constantly translate myself into the dominant culture. And now I'll invite anyone to elaborate upon what they've written. Yeah. So I'm a librarian here at Vanderbilt in the Divinity School and the Librarian for Ethics. And I'm thinking specifically of like during the pandemic when everyone was working from home, my workplace and my colleagues and my supervisor created a space that made me feel very empowered to do my job, but also to take care of myself. And I felt like they trusted me to do my work, do my work well. Um, and meanwhile, I was hearing all kinds of like horror stories from other people's workplaces and their supervisors. And I was like, couldn't be me. So I felt very lucky to be in that kind of a workspace during that really stressful time. Yeah, so they prioritized your own well-being. They trusted you as a competent professional and weren't micromanaging uh, your tasks. That's something I've had the privilege of experiencing right now um, in my internship site, which I just finished yesterday. Um, it was the first space where I felt like my supervisor uh, treated me as a co-equal of the team, trusted my abilities, and their confidence in me allowed me to bring more confidence into the work I was doing with middle school students. Uh, would anyone else like to author their story? Um, my name is Eliza Blades. I work in the Office of Student Engagement and Wellbeing over at Peabody College in the Education School. Um, and my my current work environment feels um, very authentic, and um, largely because um, it's a space where I feel um, like I have a lot of freedom and flexibility to build relationships and to lean on those relationships. Um, and because of that, I feel very inspired. I feel very productive. Um, and I feel like I'm working towards a larger goal. <laughs> yeah, so you, I'll come right back to you. Um, so you described that aspirational authenticity that we're all working toward this uh, future goal that we feel aligned toward and that resonates with your internal values. Thank you. Hey there, Mario Avila, also a former fellow uh, from 2012, now the director of the Turner Family Center for Social Ventures over at the Business School. I think it's important, I appreciate you asking this question, and for me it's trying to define space. And so for me, space has been my work since being a student and being a fellow. And sitting next to Cal, I pulled up my reflection from 11 years ago. And I'll just read the last paragraph. I said, as I look back at the year, I realize that I have learned a fair amount from the program and the other fellows. I have majored in sociology, I majored in sociology in college <clears throat> and actually never thought about attending business school or starting my own company. <sighs> now after two years of business school and a year as a fellow, I'm happy to say that, I, that my focus and raison d'etre, my reason for being, have not changed. I'm still very passionate about helping the Hispanic community and finding solutions for poverty in the United States. The Cal Turner program allowed me to be around like-minded Vanderbilt graduate students from different disciplines, all sharing a common goal for good. And so for me, that's, that's the space that this fellowship allowed for me, to be around people, right, that care about others, and as our pastor said, about the human. And to me, I hope that you as fellows don't define space as just work, but space is your livelihood and who you are, and you take that wherever you go. Beautiful. Thank you, Mario. Can we all send some love over to Mario for that sharing? That was wonderful. Um, <laughs> and uh, one of the aspects that we talk about for the antidotes to white supremacy culture is interge intergenerational storytelling. So I think it's really beautiful to have previous generations of moral fellows here 
um, as well as Cal Turner himself, to um, share your experience. So it's beautiful. Yes. Um, I'd like to know that you don't really have Cal Turner here, but I would like to help him come. Um, I'm the one here who knew him, and he was the only survivor of three children, so he grew up as an only child, and I think his motivation in life was to have more brothers and sisters. And everyone with whom he did business became part of his family. And he was, um, he considered himself to be unsophisticated. Um, he came to Vanderbilt his freshman year, and that was enough of that for him, <laughs> and thought that he was proof that a college dropout can't really succeed <laughs> without others. And the mission statement of the company he founded, which really empowered the success of that company, was just two words, serving others. Life is not about me. It's, it's not about us. It's about others, and my greatest opportunity and our greatest opportunity is serving. Serving is an ongoing process, and the more dedication we had to serving our struggling customer, the greater the success of the enterprise. And the greater the individual successes of the Dollar General employees or associates. And being part of the success of others can be the most rewarding accomplishment on earth. And this program I hope empowers that and that this program I hope inspires each of you individually to go for your unique opportunity under our creator to fulfill your uniqueness in partnership with God and with others. But I just wanted you to have a sense of the real Cal Turner for whom this is named. Thank you. Yeah, let's send some love for that. Thank you. Um. <laughs> A new language of love, amazing. Um, <laughs> so we talked about like the importance of bringing emotion, storytelling, creativity into the workplace, and I just feel very grateful for you all to be sharing your stories and your emotions in this room right now. Um, so thank you. Um, what's next? Impacts. Okay, so we kind of just did it. Like, what do we see in an authentic workplace? I think we would see the sort of tenderness and compassion that we all just felt in that moment together. Um, groups have brought up this idea of psychological safety, the feeling that I won't be punished for speaking up, for asking questions, or for offering feedback. There should be dynamics, which means variance in how people complete similar tasks. 
and flexibility. So space is actively made for people to uh, complete tasks in their own way. We saw this with one of the beneficial outcomes of a lot of uh, uh, jobs impacted by COVID-19 where now people can choose if they work remotely or kind of a mix of both, that flexibility. And, um, and as our librarian friend said, that people are trusted to be competent professionals and trusted to complete the work in a way that best works for them. Okay, so Max and I had a lot of questions about how we should phrase this section because we can't tell you how to be authentic, like you do you, <laughs> like, but here are some suggestions. Um, so first, before we do that, we kind of wanted to talk a little bit about what we thought authentic leadership looked like in each of our professions. And in the middle, Stephanie has shared um, what she thinks it should look like in the business world. Um, for me in law, I think that lawyers should always be humble and prioritize their client well-being. Um, as someone going into civil rights, it's really important to recognize that even though I've had my own experiences, I'm not there to share my own story. I'm there to elevate those of my clients. Um, again, it's really important to spend time for self-reflection and also to genuinely engage in building meaningful relationships with my coworkers, community members, and clients. And I think working with the community is really important to me because I come from a policy research background and my research lab was literally called the Poverty Lab. So we could never say our name when we did research studies because we didn't want to be like, hello, you are the poverty I am here to study. And so I think this is something that's really stuck with me, the importance of being in community and not being separated by an ivory tower. And lastly, um, like I said, I think it's really important to recognize my own personal experiences and my own background as the daughter of immigrants, as the first person in my family to go to law school, um, just to sort of bring that all with me into my workspace. Yeah, and picking up of, off of that, I really feel like my trans identity and my kind of life story is central to the best work that I can do and be as a counselor. And so I'd like to center the counselor identity as the basis for treatment, not something that we should hide or ignore or that we think gets in the way of treatment. Um, I also believe that we as counselors have to be well in order to serve our clients' wellness. And finally, celebrating different ways of being as an ecstatic representation of the pluralistic society that we live in. And following, we have our uh, non-exhaustive list of suggestions for what you can do. All right, so first, um, you should explore some core values. Um, we have this little handout here with lots of values. Um, I did this exercise back in college, but basically you like circle your top 10 and then you go down and then you circle your top three and you have to think about what values resonate both in your personal and in your professional lives because if they're really your core values, they shouldn't be different. Um, it's also really important to ask for honest feedback because as authentic leaders, it's important to recognize how your leadership is doing good or doing bad for those around you. Um, we wanna make sure that we are sharing our own stories because if you don't show who you are in the workspace, it might be really hard for your coworkers and peers to feel comfortable doing so as well. Uh, we wanna make sure we are approaching things without judgment and seeking to understand and not just to be understood. And I know I'm just spewing a lot of very short phrases at you, but I feel like it's really important just to kind of think about experiences um, in your life that have been similar to these. So for example, I was a resident assistant in college and the most important thing when a resident broke a rule was not to say, hey, like you broke this rule, I'm telling the professor or something, but rather, are you doing okay? Like why, like what's going on? And then we also wanna make sure we are always willing to keep growing because that is what leaders do. And then we have one more handout for y'all um, in case you wanna do it, but it's called the Leadership Compass. And basically um, it talks about how every direction of a compass has different attributes to different leaders. And if you wanna do the assessment, I think you'll learn that you don't fit squarely into any of the categories. And Max will close our presentation. Yeah, and it was really helpful for me to do this assessment because I was like, oh, I feel, I'm really strongly a South type leader and 
before I recognized there were three other ways to be a leader, I was like, oh, South is just the way to be a good leader. And now that I saw this, I was like, oh my gosh, there are like so many other ways that fit in, um, uh, that fill in the gaps of my own style. And so now I'm like excited to build out um, those other skills and others. And yeah, we just want to say thank you. Thank you for offering yourselves and your stories. And thank you for sitting in a chair for like three hours. Thank you. All right, for the purposes of time, we are not going to do a group uh, Q&A of the groups. Um, if you do have questions of our presenters, we will be posting uh, their slideshows after I get their permission, um, hopefully then, because uh, we do believe in informed consent and full consent um, on our website. Um, so you will be able to find um, and reach to them uh, through Vanderbilt with uh, CTP, look for Cal Turner program. That is how you find our website. Um, and uh, this is being live streamed to our Vanderbilt Divinity account. And you can also find the recording thereafter. And so either look up the recording, find the slideshow decks. There are many ways to contact the students if you want to be in touch and ask a question. Um, if anybody has a big burning final question of the fellowship or of the way we do things, we would entertain a question. But if you want leftovers, there are takeaway containers in the back as people are um, packing up the food. So our fellows know that there is always extra food. Um, so they are already well trained and back there taking oh, home a tray. <laughs> Wave, Isaac. <laughs> um, but any questions, any questions that might pertain to all the groups as an exit parking lot question? All right, thank you all for being here. Yes, um, we do want the fellows to gather for a picture, hopefully with Cal. Um, we can gather here in the corner, I believe. Yeah, why don't we try to do that? Um, group photo, those of us who are here, please take off your name tag. And thank you to our guests, our fellow alumni, and others who came. <laughs>